Did you know Adam Sandler is responsible for this massive hit cover song? I will always love you. Yeah, so he was doing that movie, Fifty First Dates with Drew Barrymore. It was all set in Hawaii, and he was like, Amber is the sound for this movie. Amber is the color of your energy bunch of classic 80s alternative songs done in uh, loosely an amber style and his suggestion for 311 is like i think you guys could crush love song that's not the only movie nick hexen was a part of though he was also immortalized on the south park soundtrack yeah the south park soundtrack was a dream come true joe strummer who was my ultimate hero the singer from the clash was asked to do a song so he put together this kind of dream band we had Blee on bass tom morello on guitar and we talked about the Nick Hexum zaddy memes? My kids, of course, are the first ones to bring it to my attention. I am aware of the effect I have on women. We talk about their first big hit song, Down, Staying Fit on the Road, and the Uber driver that hates them. Check it all out on this week's episode of my podcast. <laughs> Well, dude, congrats on the latest single. You're going to get it. Uh, I, first of all, I was surprised to hear it on Octane when I saw it in the uh, in the log on uh, Octane. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's um, been kind of our first single that really had a shot at active rock. But you know, we've always had you know heaviness and big riffs as part of our thing, but maybe not as far as the single selection. So it's it's cool to have a. Uh, a single that is going for that that heavier sound that we've kind of moved more towards that in a in the past few albums there's been kind of some key songs that used a little bit of like edm arrangement as far as like the drums and having like a bil big build going into a drop um but and this one you're gonna get it definitely has that and is super fun to play live Oh yeah, I mean that chorus definitely kicks in the teeth, and and like you say, you guys have always had like you've always dabbled in some heavier music. I mean, obviously, there's always been a ton of like distorted guitar throughout your you know career. I guess I guess maybe some of the bigger singles were a little bit more you know melodic and a little easier on the on the ears. So maybe that's why people are like, oh no, is three eleven changing the sound? Like maybe people who aren't like super well versed in like the, the celebrating the entire discography. But yeah, man, it's a cool and also. I was a little worried. I thought Essay wasn't going to rap on this one until the second <laughs> verse. Then comes in I'm like, oh, okay, cool. There he is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it definitely has the the three eleven DNA, and you know, thinking about that um, eclecticness that even from going back to our very first album, we would have like a super light song like "My Stony Baby," which was just like this light kind of kind of a funky like the meters kind of drum beat going into it and then have that next to a song like hydroponic which was like like almost like a black sabbath riff yeah. so we've always tried to have a super wide um variety in what we do and that's can be a little off-putting for some people because like oh i thought they sounded like this and now there's this <laughs> hey we we put it all in our music whatever we like we're there yeah, I know there are a lot of people who like to box in their favorite artists and be like, well, no, I want you to only make this kind of song. This is the one I like. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can't be fenced in by, no. by genres. And in fact, I had a funny experience um, the other day. I had a, um, a day off in Albuquerque and I, I got in an Uber and I got in the car and the woman was listening to Stick Figure, which is a reggae band that we played with quite a bit. And I was like, oh, you, you got some cool music on here. Um, how do you feel about 311? She's like, no, it's too heavy for me. She, I was like, so you don't like 311? She's like, it's not that I don't like him, but it's just like too hard and heavy for me. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, yes, that's one of our things. That's fine. If you're that 311 hating Uber driver out there and you're listening right now, <laughs> just know you missed a golden opportunity to hang out with Nick Hexum. <laughs> That's right. I was like, okay, moving yeah. on. <laughs> Dude, the music video is really cool too. It has kind of like a, a fight club vibe to it. So did you join any underground fight clubs in preparation for the video to really get in the character? So in the early 2000s, I worked with this guy, Mike Hazard, who is a, a boxing trainer and just just for the workout of it. And I had done, you know, I, I knew the proper stance, like, mm -hmm. you know, your left hand should be like, you're holding a microphone and your right hand should be like, you're, um, 
you know, holding a phone. So I, I knew that and I'd done some sparring and uh, which, by the way, sparring is the most exhausting thing. The, the oh, most yeah. important part is to like stay calm because you just adrenaline is firing so crazy that it's easy to get like super winded. But it is the mo- the most intense workout to have like an actual foe that you're sparring with. So I that was kind of a while ago, but I I remembered it all. So I was able to competently look like I was <laughs> actually boxing. Yeah, you can get gassed after like five minutes of sparring with someone and not even really like that's why a lot of people when they watch like UFC fights, especially they'll be like, like, it's only like three minutes. They can't hang for three more minutes. Like you don't understand until you're in there for those three million more minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's exhausting. So no underground fight clubs for you to get prepped for. But uh, I mean, you were looking super ripped regardless in the video. What's your like fitness and workout routine like these days? So, um, I guess I jokingly say, you know, people say, how do you do it? It's one easy step work out every day for 35 years. Like I've been, <laughs> I've been early in like in my late teens, I realized that when I got some exercise that that helped me with my, my mental side of things. So I would, I would go jogging to like, help me like calm down and get out extra energy and kind of help with any anxiety. I've always just felt like it was easier to work on your physical health and your mental health will follow like, Mm -hmm. you know, endorphins and it's like nature's antidepressant. So I've always been into it for that. And then I think lately, you know, like we all know dudes that are, um, you know, do a lot of like, like our manager and 311 does marathons and he's like super cut and skinny. And then we all know dudes who are like kind of big. And, and to me, I've just kind of worked on moving that slider between cardio and strength training. And I keep finding kind of ways to evolve that to get it better. And, um, and now I'm on tour, so I'm <laughs> pretty lean because there's just so much physical activity yeah between the show and, and the workouts. And I also was like paddle boarding and riding bikes around here in Newport beach yesterday. So I just, I love being active and, um, and also I get a lot of sleep. I've worked on getting my, I have got this aura ring. So it helps me make sure that I'm getting enough restorative sleep and just finding different sort of health hacks to very cool. Keep getting better. Yeah, because I mean, obviously you burn a ton of calories on stage. And then it's like when you're on tour, especially, it's so hard to like find time to like even eat. You know, you have so much going on. And it's like, obviously, I know that sometimes you get kind of stuck maybe eating fast food or whatever's in catering and stuff. But like, even if you can even find the time to eat to begin with, that's the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And also just learning to plan the meals at the right time because if you eat a big meal before a show, it's just that takes so much of your body's energy and your blood is down in your stomach and you will feel very tired. So I learned to plan it just right that I yeah. am pretty on a fairly empty stomach, but not too empty because sometimes um, during a show I'll be like, Oh, there's nothing in the tank and I'll have them like right. give me some grape juice or something to drink during the breaks to make sure I have enough energy to get through the show. But you know, we're just always trying to learn little hacks of ways to improve. Yeah, I mean, not too much liquid. You want the abs to be popping during the set, right? <laughs> yeah, you know. Doesn't are hurt. you uh, are you aware of the Nick Hexum Zaddy memes that are going around? I did become. Uh, there was, I guess, a, sh- a, a radio festival we did in Phoenix, um, kind of in the beginning of the year, and someone posted a video, and I I did wasn't even familiar with the terminology because she just wrote on the video, "He's giving Zaddy." <laughs> I did not know what zaddy and she didn't even bother saying. And once I learned what zaddy yeah. meant, then it, she didn't even bother saying he's giving zaddy vibes. He just said, she just said he's giving zaddy and all, and that like apparently caught on and got, um, reposted <laughs> a lot. And my kids of course are the first ones to bring it to my attention. Right. You know, and let me you know, give you all the vernacular. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It reminds me of that. Um, I don't know if you ever watched The Office, but the Charles Minor episode. Where he's like, "Yes, I'm aware of the effect I have on women." 
<laughs> That's so good. All yeah. right, so the wine thing's and, but, back, and, Zaddy. Uh, <laughs> I got one one more oh, little yeah. story about that. Um, a couple of years ago, when first somebody was posting like that, and my youngest daughter was just starting to get into social media, and she would like retort to these people, "He <laughs> married." He <laughs> married. <laughs> he married like you're not supposed to be yeah. saying things about my dad he married <laughs> <laughs> i like that she came to the defense though that's so that's so adorable yeah. she's like stay away had from my, my dad he's happily had, married <laughs> had her mom's back it's pretty cool that is amazing dude so let's wind things back a little bit the blue album as it's so affectionately called by 311 fans the self-titled album that was my introduction to you guys i mean i named my dog peanut after I <laughs> discovered, I mean, she looks like a peanut already, but it worked too because I liked the band, you know. Uh, and then uh, "Down" was like my like skateboarding anthem. That's the track I'd throw on anytime I try to fall down doing an ollie out in the skate park. And I was very very bad, but I tried. <laughs> but uh, that song I read that wasn't even uh, released as a single or, or kind of reached its pinnacle until about two years after the album came out. Is that correct? Yeah, it was the third single. The um, label thought that it was too too hard, but we we pushed him. I was like, "All right, we've done your two choices. Like, we started that album with Don't Stay Home, which is very melodic, and then we went with All Mixed Up. And then after the album had been out over a year, and we talked him into doing a third single, and that was down. And then that became like a buzz clip on MTV." And I was like, that chorus, it's just, that, that's the hook, man. It sticks in people's mm -hmm. head. That's the one. Trust me, trust me, trust me. So finally that song did get a chance and then um, really had legs and went up to number one and got us to get to play on David Letterman and Conan O'Brien and stuff, which was like a big, huge deal being on, on TV. Um, and then we put out all mixed up again as the fourth single and that had legs and lasted for a really long time. So it was, it was a really very exciting time, but it really did start with the, you know, skaters and BMXers and rollerbladers, surfers, like the extreme sports community was, that was uh, the first people that really embraced us, um, and getting into like skate and surf videos just kind of getting in with the cool kids first yeah you know and then that kind of led to the the grassroots thing all of a sudden blowing up and the the shows did change quite a bit after the down video because all of a sudden we a lot of our fans that had been with us for a couple of years were like all of a sudden there's all these kids here there's yeah. all these high school kids like standing in line MTV for a beer. Kids. What the hell? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, hey, we're not elitist. We 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 want to touch everybody, and you know, having younger people there is very good. Good for us, not just on a business level, but just touching more people and then a lot of those people have stayed with us for a long time so it all worked out pretty good so was that you think the moment in your career where you started to kind of break away from the underground a little bit and you realized like, okay we've kind of we've reached to the next level now we're on to the next thing yeah because our second album was called grassroots and that was really about our approach was just like we're just going to tour 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 um can't couldn't count like radio at the time was all about like Seattle and grunge and stuff. And we, you know, had like rap and reggae and stuff in our music. So we didn't really fit in with that. So we're like, we're just going to do it through grassroots means. Um, and we kept that philosophy going of like that on that blue album tour, we did like hundreds of shows. Like we were just go and go, 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 go. And then to the pack, the fact, the point that we actually got into some exhaustion and we're like 1998, we need to take that year off because mm -hmm. we had just been going nonstop and then let it all through the blue album into transistor, which was like, we recorded 30, 30 um, songs for that album and did a tour. And so we took 98 to just like, let's get, you know, house to live in, you know, everybody got houses and like, let's, Getting getting a, a dog and getting some sort of like putting yeah. some roots down, but it was it was a nutty time. Do you look back finally on the year of ninety eight? Then like, oh, that was a chill year. <laughs> uh, 
I would say. Uh, or you were know, you bored? You were probably bored in '98. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it, it needed to happen. Yeah, but um, that that such an exciting time when you know in in '95 and '96 as you could just feel the momentum building up, and now I've become friends with you know younger bands that are going through their own similar moment like talking to my friends from turnstile and just getting to to feel a little bit of that um vicarious pleasure of having that that big explosion so yeah it's, it's cool to see other bands have a similar journey yeah dude turnstile what a what a band uh, <laughs> that's a that's an unprecedented like unexpected kind of rise like in like the, the mainstream like, attention they give like a what's considered a hardcore band is pretty cool yeah yeah. And I, it just, I was, it was before the pandemic that I was, um, doing a photo shoot with my friend, George Clanton and the photographer had this band. I was like, what is that? He was like, Oh, these are my boys turnstile it was before, um, you know, they had gotten big at all. And I was like, this is badass. There's a little bit of bad brains. And, mm -hmm. but I could hear the melody and stuff and know that it was like, it was really going places. So I actually did a cover of, um, one of their early songs, um, called, uh, blue by you, um, on my Instagram during the pandemic, I did a little cover of it. And, and some of the guys in the band had grown up on three eleven, So it was, it was a cool moment. And then of course they blew up after that. <laughs> so I was, it was nice to hear that a bunch of people heard about them through me first. Yeah. Dude, you're 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 hip to the trend before a lot of these kids, these like kiddos out there. <laughs> so another uh, obviously big moment for the band was when you guys did the song Amber. Was that a song that you felt like right away, like we had a hit on our hands? Again, it was like the on the Blue album. Like to me, I felt like it was a very special song, but it was so much softer than other singles that we had done but i was like please just give it a shot and it was the third single again it was you know they kind of went with something that was a little bit more expected i think we had um you wouldn't believe was um our first single i can't remember which one was the the second one but anyway i was like just just give just give amber a chance and then they did and that song really had legs like E even more than any of our other songs, it was such a slow burn that it just kept going for years. Um, and then we followed it up with, with love song, which was Adam Sandler's idea from, from that movie, 50 first States. And then but because that had a kind of a similar arrangement with a really warm, soft sounding sounds to it, then that also that Amber and love song was just, slow burned through the whole early 2000s and really turned on a lot of people to us showing that, that other side but apparently that uber driver was not familiar <laughs> with that side of us but whatever was she now yeah. <laughs> so wait adams it was adam sandler's idea for you guys to cover love song by the cure yeah yeah so he was doing that movie 50 first dates with drew barrymore and Classic. it yeah it was all set in hawaii and he was like Amber is the sound for this movie, but I want to do a bunch of classic eighties alternative songs, um, done in a, in a, in a reggae style done in uh, loosely an Amber style. So I actually, um, and his suggestion for, for three eleven is like, I think you guys could crush love song and early days before three eleven, me and Tim had a, like a college rock alternative band in, in the mid eighties. And we did a lot of the Smiths and the cure, not reggae, but just doing like you yeah. know, <laughs> faithful, faithful covers of them. So I was a big cure fan, but I, I wasn't really familiar with the disintegration album um, as much as their earlier stuff. But when I listened to it, I was like, Oh yeah. And I actually cranked out the demo on my tour bus in my tour bus studio in like a day. And I sent it to him and he was like, Oh yeah, this is, this is it. So we actually recorded, love song on the tour bus in my studio except we recorded the drums in a venue i think it might have been at the electric factory in in philadelphia um and then adam sandler asked me to do like four other songs i 
I did um, Lips Like Sugar, the Echo and the Bunnymen song with Seal singing. Like I made all the tracks and then sent them to – we had Jason Mraz doing Stop the World and Melt With You. I worked with – Dried in from Alien Ant Farm, doing a, a different Cure song, um, which name escapes me right now. But yeah, it was a really cool time to do five songs for that um, for that soundtrack. Yeah, so it was such busy. a cool movie too. And like, I it's really weird because I knew about your cover and that movie independently. Like, I didn't really when I was a, when I was younger, I didn't piece together that it was written specifically for that. I just thought like, oh, he that's a perfect song for this movie. Like, Oh yeah, no shit because it was, it was done on purpose. <laughs> yeah. But It was Adam's yeah. idea. That is great. Um, so are you excited for uh, happy Gilmore too? Sure. Yeah. I, <laughs> he's hilarious. I wasn't aware that was in the works. Oh yeah. It's in production. They, uh, he, he, he revealed it's officially a go. I guess Travis Kelsey is going to have a cameo in it. So thanks. We'll see, man. I'm all for more Adam Sandler movies out there, man. He's uh he's he makes great films that like he doesn't really seem to give a shit about what the critics think of what he does, you know. He just makes movies that he thinks are funny and the audience generally thinks is funny. So I like that. Yeah. You know, he, that's that whole like just following your heart and not being worried about genres or boundaries and stuff. It works in film or music or anything. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of uh, movies, you know, aside from you know doing having a thirty plus year illustrious career of making hits, you were also immortalized on the South Park soundtrack, correct? Yeah, the South Park soundtrack was a um, like kind of a dream come true that um, Joe Strummer, who was my ultimate hero, the singer from the Clash, um, was asked to do a song, and then he, so he put together this kind of dream band to him and i was just so honored to be invited and we had flea on bass we had me and tom morello on guitar um rick rubin and george draculius were pr- producing we had dj bone break from the band x on drums ben montench from tom Pe- uh, petty and the heartbreakers on keyboards so it was just like this cool and i was still pretty i think this was like 97 so i was only 27 years old and being with my number one hero yeah in, in the studio with him was pretty uh pretty incredible it was nice to become friends with them and it was super tragic when he passed away a few years later of course what was, so what was it like the moment you found out that your hero joe strummer is a fan of yours or even knew who you were like how did that even like how did that realization come so um, we were friends with a guy who was, had been managing Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros, which was his band after the clash. And he was aware that I was a huge clash fan. He was like, Joe's coming over for a dinner party. Nick, you and Adam Raspler, uh, our manager at the time, come on over. You can meet Joe. And I was like, sweet. And then, <laughs> um, when I showed up at the, at this house in the Hollywood Hills, I heard there was like this cool, like Cuban salsa music coming out of a boom box. And I went over and I was grooving by the, and I, I saw a sticker on the boom box. It was like this little alien head. And we used to sell this sticker pack with a 311 logo and five alien heads. And I was like, that's a 311 sticker. And I looked at the top of the boom box and I had it, the, the big 311 logo. I was like, this is so awesome. Whose boom box is this? And the manager guy was like, that's Joe's boom box. No so way. the fact that we our sticker was on his boombox was so mind blowing. And then when I met him, he's like, Oh yeah, you know, I got a boom box and I had to make it look cool. He had some other stickers on there like Fender guitars and and the fact that he chose our sticker, because I mean he could he could hear the influence from yeah, you know, in, in three eleven from from the clash with the reggae and the punk and and all, and just the no boundariesness, like that's what I loved mm-hmm. about the Clash. Is like they had one of the first breakdancing funk hits with their Magnificent Seven. Was the song that all the New York breakers were were dancing to in the in the early eighties, and and you know they would just go stylistically anywhere they wanted to go, and that was always a, a huge influence. Like, don't let yourself be fenced in, you know. So yeah. getting to become friends with him and. You know, he told me a lot of little um, t- tidbits of wisdom, like 
learn about your family tree. You're going to find that really interesting. And I've definitely done that of kind of amassing stuff from, um, from relatives to just cause it's, it's, it's a nonfiction exciting story. Like, Oh, this person like got on a boat and, and, yeah. and, and Joe also said, you know, the original clash was based on blue collar, like first or second generation immigrants. He was like, there's something about those like hungry people. He said on the later version of the clash, when he had replaced people with like London insiders, he said, mm -hmm. it just wasn't the same, man. It just wasn't the same immigrants. It's like that, <laughs> that song from Hamilton immigrants that get the job done. Like it was, he really believed that and, and definitely really believed in this sort of, um, the power to the people thing that they, that they talked about. So it was, it was just really cool to get to know him. Well, especially too, when the band first started off, like you said, they were hungry. They were just like trying to make it, you know, so it's probably hard to recapture that kind of magic with any buddy other than other hungry musicians, like regardless of where they're from. But yeah, like you said, especially like the whole immigrant mentality, I'm sure that played a huge part of it too. Yeah. You, you just can't fake like hunger and, and passion. So I'm, I'm very, and a lot of people, a lot of time that wanes for people. And mm -hmm. to me, I'm very excited that I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that I'm so excited about the new 311 music. I've got some different side projects cooking and it's, uh, it, I'm, I'm just excited that the 311 seems to be reaching some new heights and in, in the new music and have a, a single like we do, which is still going into new territory. It's an it's an insane career, man. There's not many bands out there that have been going as hard as you guys for as long as you have consistently. And it's not like you're not doing like a like a golden oldies tour and that you're not like just like rehashing old shit. It's like you guys are still putting out new stuff and like just killing it, man. It's it's just really cool to see it, man. Especially as somebody who, you know, grew up like not to like be like, oh, I was like, I was just a little whippersnapper when I found you guys, <laughs> but like, but like having your music in my life, like growing up, it's just cool to see you guys still, I can still go see you live, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, to me, I'm totally happy leaning into the whole elder statesman thing. I mean, mm -hmm. some people might not want to like call attention to their age, but to me every night during the show, before we do applied science, which was the, the song where we bring out the big drums and mm -hmm. um, do a whole long extended thing i i talked to the audience about you know earlier this summer we just celebrated 34 years of being a band same five guys getting to do what we love and how grateful we are to do that because there is just something about that evolution that that can't be fake to have those you know the five of us having that that kind of history together of of playing that it's something special and you know, we're very, very lucky that all our original members are, are healthy and, and with us and getting along. And it's, <laughs> it's unreal, cool. man. Like how you guys don't hate each other after 34 years. <laughs> it's just that even that part is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You got to respect democracy and know that mm -hmm. sometimes you're not going to get your way. Um, and just keep it, you know, an attitude of gratitude, knowing that we're very lucky to be able to do this and we're, we're better together than we would be apart. So let's just keep her going. Speaking of, you guys just did, uh, I think just a, a week ago, dropped the 30 year anniversary edition of Grassroots, right? Yeah. What went we into putting it. that album together and what was it like to give that kind of another, because that was your second album and it was before like the, you know, the blue album, the one that really guys put you guys on the map. So you guys got a chance here to kind of put that album out again almost and give it another breath of life. So what kind of went into that? I mean, mainly the the mastering techniques have changed so much. Like if you listen to the original CD of any of our albums from the 90s compared to a remaster, they just now they sound so much, they hit harder. And so it, you know, it's louder, it's the compression techniques and the EQing and so forth. So um, and then just having a really high quality vinyl release of that. Um, and so that's really, you know, got to give props to Chad, our drummer, because he's really like the, the audiophile and vinyl guy who oversees mm -hmm. all that. So it was cool to see. And so we'll keep, you know, updating 
um, the albums as the 30 year anniversary. Um, the first three albums came out 93, 94, 95. So we were like, now we're due for a, a 30 year anniversary of the blue album next year. That's so cool, man. I can't wait for that one. It's gonna be pumped. <laughs> it was it had to be fun to kind of go back through like all those old masters and like maybe some of the songs on there on that album that you haven't listened to in a long time and kind of revisit them and like with fresh ears. Yeah, it just really brings you back to the mind state of like because you can hear the rooms, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. you you can hear the room recording, especially grassroots was recorded in our living room at the time. We had had a, a producer that like set up a, a studio in our in our little rental house in Van Nuys, and I it just really takes me back because I can hear the distinct sound of the walls. We didn't really have very good soundproofing, but a lot of times that creates a unique sound. Like if you listen mm-hmm. to Led Zeppelin when the levee breaks, that was just a very specific living room that without a baffling and you know sound reduction and stuff that creates that sound so it actually can be kind of create a very unique sound to record in weird places it's a good point because you know obviously a lot of music now is recorded like in the box you know it's all a lot of stuff on laptops and you know electronic instruments which is like you know not to discredit the way people record now it's just you know it's evolution recording technology but like you said, you do miss out on some gems like that where like the room can change how a record sounds. Like you hear a lot of like people who have recorded like big legendary albums and they top out the room, like the, the the feel, the acoustics in the room, and like you don't get that, you know, out of a laptop, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And having a good engineer or producer who knows how to mic far away in some cases mm-hmm. and and compress that that room mic a lot so you can really pick up the 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 character of the room is important. Yeah. Got to keep that room. Got to keep that room vibe, baby. <laughs> yeah. So you're currently uh, wrapping up the tour with AWOL Nation, Neon Trees. What is next? Are you able to tell us what's next? What's on the plan? Are you guys working on a new album? Give me these, give me these juicy details. <laughs> I am allowed to say that the album is definitely coming out this year. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's done. It's mixed. Um, I'm not supposed to say the title yet, but we've, we've, we picked a cover and we picked a title and we picked what the next single is going to be. Um, so I'm not allowed to spill the beans just yet, but I will let everybody know that it's, it's coming out this fall and um, just super excited to, for, for people to hear it because it was a little overdue because of COVID and everything. It's been five years since we put out an album. And so we're really like, come on guys, let's keep the, process rolling a little bit more and not have such a, a long wait because our fans are are waiting and yeah. it, it just adds so much excitement to the shows to have brand new music and um so we're we're hoping to keep the the production and the output a little bit more regular but first thing is this this new album that uh we've worked with some new producers um Tim Pagnata, who is the um, lead singer of the band Sugar Colt, who used to have our same management. He's a badass producer. He's done a lot of big songs with Neon Trees and Blink-182 oh. and Weezer. And um, and then this other guy, Colin Britton, younger dude. Um, 311 was you know important for his formative years. He tells me the story of when his high school band all piled into a car and drove from Knoxville down to Atlanta to, to see a 311 show and it just changed his life. So, but he has some really brought, got some really new stuff out of us with his, with his recording techniques and, and suggestions. So, um, and then, you know, some one song produced by Scott Trollson, who's been our longtime sound man and producer and, and Chad Sexton, our drummer actually report, recorded or produced a couple songs. So, um, but yeah, we feel, feel it's a huge step forward and just can't wait for people to hear it. That's great, man. That's awesome to hear also that, uh, the guy from sugar cult is involved because I was just talking about that band the other day and wondering like what, because they, they, they had some huge hit songs and like i'm like what happened to those guys like i'm glad he's still out there making hit music that's awesome <laughs> yeah he's just a studio guy he doesn't like loud live music anymore um yeah. but he i mean he loves music but he just likes to protect his hearing so 
he doesn't play live Smart. anymore, but um, he he's really a soulful, great, r- really good help with melodies. He would be like, "We already did that melody. Let's try this little variation." Oh, like, oh, good idea. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited for new 311 album. I'm excited for the next single, but if 311 history has taught us anything, I'm excited for the third single of this record. Okay, <laughs> right. like that's going to be the one. Hopefully, <laughs> hope we get that far. It's, you know. The, <laughs> The cycles move faster than ever now, but yeah. you know what? We'll see what happens. Well, before we get out of here, I want to try a new feature with you real quick, a new idea. So if this tanks, it's your fault. Uh, I'm okay. going to blame you for it. Uh, I want to do like one kind of random topic every week on the show and give uh, the artist a chance to give their opinion on it. So one grunge band has to go, and hopefully you like grunge enough to answer this question for me. <laughs> so one grunge band has to go. Nirvana, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden or Pearl Jam? Who are you kicking in the curb? I don't like this game. I, I, have, to like, <laughs> I have to criticize one of the, the big four. No, you don't have to criticize them, but if you had to... You, you have a van and you can only invite three of the bands. <laughs> I mean, I've had such strong phases of all four of those bands. Yeah, I mean... Nirvana is obviously the most successful one, so they don't need my help. So you can take them out. <laughs> but I, I love all those bands so much. Yeah, it's a tough choice, man. <laughs> there, ah, man. Yeah, I'm, I was going to try to answer for you, but I don't think I can pick one either. <laughs> the game, the game's flawed. They're just, the bands are too good. <laughs> <laughs> too all right, Nick. Well, dude, again, thank you so much for talking to me. I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Do you have any uh, more last minute plugs or anything else that we didn't cover before we get out of here? No, just can't wait for people to hear the new album. And then next year we'll, we'll tour again. So follow me at, at Nick Hexum on both uh, all the major socials. And thank you for the time today. This is awesome. Absolutely. And I have been Jesse Lee. You can find me at Jesse Lee on TikTok and Instagram at Jesse Lee Show on X. And above all else, no matter what you do, where you're listening and watching right now, please make sure to share this episode with someone that doesn't suck. All right. Take it easy now. Bye bye.